campaign. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're going to be having some spirited conversations this afternoon, but before we jump into this evening's um, program, I want to welcome two folks here to do a special welcome. Uh, one on behalf of the Human Rights Campaign, and then the other on behalf of Mental Health America. Uh, ben Needham, would you like to start? Thank you, Maurice. Um, good evening. I'm Ben Needham, and I'm the director of Project One America here at the Human Rights Campaign. I'm also the sponsor of the um, ERG, our Person of Color, People of Color ERG year uh, at the organization. I want to just thank everyone for being out here this evening. Um, our ERG has been working extremely hard to sort of pull this event together. Um, and our ERG is making some tremendous impacts to the work that we do here at um, HRC. They are using their powerful, diverse voices to really change the way we think about the work that we do here and the programs that we're implementing. Uh, and so I, th I thank the ERG for, for that. Uh, if you're watching at home, if you're sitting in the audience, or if you're on your tablet or phone out there in the, in the world, uh, welcome this evening. Um, I hope that you are prepared for some great discussion. Uh, and I hope that um, you leave here um, with the tools needed to, um, for a little bit more um, self-help um, and, and really sort of taking care of our, our mental health as well. So thank you so much and have a great evening. And now we have our representative from Mental Health America. Sorry, I'm a little shorter. Um, hi guys, my name is America Paredes. I am the Senior Director for Partnerships and Community Outreach at Mental Health America. Uh, Mental Health America is a national organization based out of Alexandria, Virginia, and we're partners with the Human Rights Campaign. We just finished, um, today's the last day for Minority Mental Health Month, and we know that it's an important conversation to have. So I'm pleased to have everybody here in the audience and those that are participating online as well. Um, the fact that mental illness is something that we continue not to talk about openly is something that we strive every day to change, and we do that by making sure that people fight in the open and not feel ashamed about living with a mental illness, and if you're struggling and uncertain of what you need to do, the idea is to share so that individuals know that it's okay to talk about it and then go and seek help if needed. Um, our philosophy focuses on the idea that we have to address mental illness before a point of crisis, what we call is our before stage four philosophy. So I hope that this conversation helps individuals to really think about what it is that they need for their mental health and also to understand what other individuals may be uh, living like when they're living with a mental illness and also how to support individuals, your loved ones, your friends, your colleagues, so that you're in a healthier state of mind. So thank you, I'm open now. We're gonna be really happy to have all these conversations going as the night pursues. Thanks. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, America. I appreciate both of your welcomes, and uh, this evening now we can uh, get started. Um, so again, today, uh, we're really going to be talking about what tonight's event is all about, and that is bringing awareness to the unique challenges of LGBTQ mental health as it pertains to minorities and particularly to people of color. Sharing stories can save lives. And that's what we're going to be having a full conversation this afternoon. Um, we'll be having two panel discussions. Uh, one first um, with some mental health experts and then two with advocates who have real lived experiences. And we'll be able to share as well. Um, we have a lot of audience joining us via Facebook Live as well. And just so you know, uh, we have um, a licensed psychologist who will be here answering questions uh, for those who want to pose them over Facebook Live. So Crystal Joseph, who will be here, um, that's, that's her there in the back, if anybody wants to see who she is. Um, she will be uh, fielding questions from those who will be offering up um, questions or suggestions from our Facebook Live audience. And then after our two panels, we'll be having a Q&A sort of slash town hall um, to culminate the evening. Um, with that said, I want to introduce our first panel. And so I will be reading their bios. And as I do that, if you can please uh, join me up on stage and then we'll be able to begin. So first, also coming from Mental Health America, we have Laquanda Roberts Buckley. 
Laquanda Roberts Buckley serves as the outreach manager in, part, in the Partnerships and Community Outreach Department of Mental Health America. She has background in direct service provision, advocacy, and the development and implementation of outreach efforts aimed at increasing mental health awareness and integration of recovery among diverse communities and populations. From our Whitman Walker Clinic here in Washington, D.C., we have Nicole Armstead. Nicole, a queer-identified black social worker, focuses her mission to the creation of safe, affirming, and inclusive therapeutic spaces for people of color who identify in the LGBTQ communities. Nicole seeks to further address the stigma associated with mental health to further highlight the intersections of mental health, race, and gender which uniquely shaves the lives of black people, black people and to further encourage self-care as an act of resilience and revolution. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> From Impulse DC, we have Christopher R. Johnson. Chris is a native Washingtonian who received a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice from the University of Maryland. Being raised in a home with two alcoholics and two older brothers, Chris had to work through several challenges, especially around what healthy and normal emotional development looks like. Working actively to incorporate healthy emotional development into his life has hated, aided him tremendously in one of his most important tasks, being a father. Chris is a proud father of three beautiful children, one who is a college graduate, and two others who are, presenting, who are pres presently attending college. <laughs> Thank you. And on our first panel, the, the last person we have is Reverend Merrick Moses. Reverend Moses is an, an ordained old Catholic priest, an urban monastic, a writer, a community activist, and teacher living in Baltimore, Maryland. This native New Yorker is a graduate of Morgan State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology and a minor in Spanish language. Ordained to the deaconate in 2004 and to the priesthood in 2008, Reverend Merrick was one of the first black trans men ordained within the old Catholic movement in Baltimore. He is the Maryland, D.C. chapter president of Black Trans Advocacy and Black Trans Men, Inc. He currently works as a victim service advocate and LGBTQ community liaison for the Office of the State's Attor Attorney for Baltimore City, Mrs. Marilyn J. Mosby, State's Attorney. Ooh, thank you. We have a, an amazing panel. We have an amazing panel this afternoon. And so with that said, I want to start us off with a few of our questions. But before we do that, would each of you take 30 seconds or a minute to just kind of say a little bit about yourself and why this conversation is important for us this afternoon? You're on. Um, my name is Laquanda Roberts Buckley. I'm with Mental Health America. This conversation is valuable to me because it reflects my life. I identify as a bisexual cis cisgender female. And also, I manage bipolar one disorder with the presence of psychosis. Um, several years ago, I lost everything, even though I was a licensed therapist. I've been a crisis counselor, and I've been an intake clinician for psychiatric hospitals. So my life changed from going to helping people get admitted to hospitals to myself being admitted to hospitals. I understand the struggle and the journeys, and I believe that my perspective, both professionally and personally, just leads me down to this road so that people will know that mental illness, mental health conditions, they are not a character flaw, and they, are, they become our strength when we're able to openly speak about them, get the treatment and the help that we need. Thank you. Nicole? Yeah, so hello, everyone. Um, and I, I really appreciate having an opportunity to be a part of this dialogue. And I think for me, um, coming from a perspective where kind of my uh, black golden rule, so to speak, was what goes on in these four walls stays in these four walls. And I see the heads nodding already, so I know I'm not by myself. Um, and that was just kind of how things were at a default baseline level. Um, and I also remember being taught at a very early age, like, don't let anyone see you cry. Don't let anyone see you buckle under pressure. Um, and so I understand what it feels like to experience anxiety and even depression at a really young age um, and not having an outlet or not feeling safe to talk about that. 
um, and growing into my blackness, growing into my queer identity, um, certainly added to that. Um, and recognizing sometimes it's not enough to just toughen it up and pray it out, that sometimes it's okay to ask for support. And I really think it's important to have that conversation. So I'm excited about being here as well. Thank you. Chris? Hello, my name is Christopher Johnson, and um, <clears throat> my perspective is coming from Washington, I'm a nation, native Washingtonian with two of uh, my parents who were alcoholics. I um, lost my self-esteem, who I was, things such as that, but also I've been in education for over 20 years, and I teach in special, special education, and I see that the same things that I went through as a, as a young man, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the students, the scholars who I teach are going through the same thing. So therefore, actually, my experiences have allowed me to be more, show more empathy to people who, who are going through things um, in their homes that they're not able to or openly tell other people. And so I come as, 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 as an ear to listen and also give direction and let them know that you can make it through, that it is possible. Merrick Moses. Hello, everyone. My name is Merrick. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Lizbeth, for inviting me. Um, I think that particularly um, as a, uh, a priest um, and having been in the church, and a lot of people use the church as psychotherapy, right? And, um, you know, this, this idea, particularly for uh, uh, black and Latinx folks, to go to the priest or go to the preacher to get your problem solved. And so um, in the position that I'm in, in uh, Black Trans Advocacy, Black Trans Men Inc., we, we see a lot of brothers trying to kill themselves. And the church didn't work. And so what I usually tell people is, you know, yes, pray to Jesus for a good therapist. And try to, de you know, to uh, release the stigma around good therapy and to understand, yes, God is a healer, amen, but he heals through the hands and eyes and ears of human beings. And so I am here hopefully to be a bridge for those who are religious or who are of faith, who are spiritual, who have so long denied um, their challenges as, as far as mental health because they were told that God would solve it all. Mm -hmm. And so I just hope that um, we get to our point in our communities, communities of color, where we realize it's okay to go to therapy. It, it's okay if you need to take medication, take the medication. It is okay to, to understand that living in this society, which is basically founded on white supremacy, sexism, homophobia, trans transphobia, that yes, mental illness is real, you know, and that we have the power to heal ourselves by working with others. Thank you, all of you. So as we jump off this conversation, and please anyone sort of jump in as you, as you see fit, uh, one of the first things I wanted to kind of break it down for everyone is for us to sort of introduce the idea of the intersectionality of minority mental health. What does it mean? How does it propose a unique challenges for members of the LGBTQ community? And how can we really identify it? How can we speak to folks about what are we really talking about here? I would say one thing is that you don't deny a person of who they are. And that in order for a person to be able to travel down the road of recovery, we have to acknowledge who that person is on, on every level. You have to acknowledge, for me, for example, that I'm an African-American female. You have to acknowledge that I'm bisexual. And you have to acknowledge that I live with a mental health condition. And so to deny one part of me, Part of me is to deny my opportunity to recovery and to be health, to be healthy because as you go through that road, that journey of recovery, you need every aspect of yourself spoken to. You need every aspect of yourself to be healed. You need every aspect of yourself to, to be whole. And so to deny a person's identity, to deny an aspect of who they are is really crippling their opportunity to enter into full recovery. Mm. Anyone else? I guess I would like to just add that I remember in going when I first began seeing a senior therapist, it was the first time in my life that I could actually, and I felt comfortable, saying everything. Uh, many times I may talk to my family about depression, but it was the first time I could actually tell people my sexuality, um, that I felt uncomfortable with that. And, and all of the therapists that I've had show, did not even show as if they were uh, um, offended, if it, they, were, they were frightened, but they came alongside with me and walked me through that through that experience. And so that's why I believe that is, that's what people need to see that when you go into this relationship with therapy and therapist, it's, it's one of trust, it's one of unconditional, and it's, it's one that, does, that is very non-judgmental. Mm. 
I'll give anyone more, one last opportunity to. Sure, sure. Introduce intersectionality for us. You know, what are the, some of the unique challenges that, that we face within the LGBTQ community and, and how it plays out? I think a lot of that has to do with survival. People are constantly in survival. I know mm. particularly for trans folks, um, housing insecurity is real. And so oftentimes we are constantly living in survival mode mm -hmm. and there are things that get lost in survival mode. Um, and that includes taking care of our mental health. Yeah. I know for many of us, particularly in the activist circles, um, uh, actually self-care is on the bottom of the list. Mm. I mean, everybody knows about burnout, right? Um, I know I got sat down a couple of times because I just couldn't handle it. Um, when my father died, that I just literally had to take a break. Um, when um, just facing the traumas that I faced um, in childhood and, and working child protection and seeing in some of the victims that I served myself, um, I didn't have that mirror. Right. And so I think a lot of the times when we talk about the challenges, persons lived experience can be a challenge, mm -hmm. particularly also to uh, around ethnicity, um, being um, black, Latino, um, my father was Panamanian, what stays in ours is stay in ours. We don't tell nobody about <laughs> it. You know, because you don't want to shame your family. Mm -hmm. And so you're walking around with, with these burdens in your heart and in your mind. And you may be able to download that stuff with your friends, maybe. Um, but then oftentimes we introduce substances like alcohol, marijuana, and it goes on and on and on because right. that is the way that we've been coping. And so I think that when I, when I speak to mental health professionals, particularly mental health professionals who are not attuned to our cultural uh, nuances, that it's important to realize the lived experience of people and also meeting people where they are. So I know in Baltimore we, we do now have pilots where uh, Baltimore City Police are, have partnered with mental health professionals to go out to meet the people where they are right. because let's be real, sometimes people are not going to get on that bus to go to therapy. They're not going to drive the therapy. So how do we make um, that accessible? And it's also around health care. How do we make health care more accessible? So those are the, some of the challenges that folks do face. Thank you very much. Oh, you want to say something? No, I was just going to just piggyback because I think that, you know, part of that conversation is having the conversation about the fact that intersections exist. Right. Um, and as a mental health provider, and I, I appreciate very much um, you speaking to the importance of meeting folks where they are and right. meeting clients where they are, um, because that isn't always just a, an issue of travel. That's an issue of like emotional capacity as well. And when someone has made a decision to engage with therapy, um, recognizing it is never the first choice. Like right. it, it just is rarely ever the first choice. Um, you know, oftentimes it's, I'm gonna pray about this. Yes. Then prayer's not necessarily working. So let me find some friends to talk about this mm -hmm. with. Sometimes friends make space and sometimes friends are like, I got my own stuff. The struggle is right. real. I got my own stuff. Right. So then you try another option. And I, I hear you speak to sometimes engaging with alcohol use, substance use. Um, but therapy is oftentimes the last, the last option. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think it is important that when someone makes that decision to come in, that we accept all of who they are, that we, we are prepared as mental health professionals right. to invite all of these identities and make space for all of these intersections that come in um, in a way that doesn't create harm, in a way that doesn't create shame. Right. You know, Reverend Moses, you talked um, about um, privilege, essentially, about the privilege to take care of yourself, privilege of self-care. I work with volunteers often, and uh, in, in, in volunteering world, it is a world of privilege in itself, right? You cannot be worried about the color of your house if your refrigerator is empty, right? And so thinking about that with regards to our access to, to health care and everything, what are some of the unique challenges that we have accessing health care, particularly for people of color as members of the LGBTQ community? <laughs> um, I will try to limit myself because I get easily excited about this conversation um, just because I think that, you know, one is that, you know, as we're already kind of talking about this idea that 
to ask for help is a sign of weakness. Um, so I think that's one challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also going alongside the conversation of white privilege um, and that when we talk about mental health, we still, whether we realize it or not, we're talking about this through the lens of, of white privilege. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think part of the challenge is visibility in and of itself or lack of visibility of therapists who also identify as black or therapists that identify as a person of color. Right. Um, even more so, a queer or trans person of color. Um, and so I think that that absence of visibility creates, certainly creates a hurdle. And Nicole, do you mind widening exactly what you mean when we say we look at it from the frame of white privilege? When you say that, what do you mean exactly? Mm -hmm. um, I, when I say that, I mean that when we, when we think about therapy, mm -hmm. um, you know, statistics and numbers will show that, you know, therapists are still majority white, it's a white cisgender, cis male um, space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that um, when, when I look at, for example, the numbers of African American therapists, it's a very low percentage. It's right. maybe anywhere from four to two percent. Sometimes oh, wow. people will argue even less than that. Um, and so the, the visibility isn't, isn't always there. Um, and I also think that the challenge, again, goes back to being able to check your bias and check your privilege when we talk about these different intersections. Mm -hmm. And that usually doesn't happen in a therapeutic space. Right. Reverend Moses, you want to talk about accessing care? Yes, and I think that, once again, that a lot of that also goes back to what you were saying about um, meeting people where they are. Um, I know that growing up, I was taught that therapy was for white people. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us were taught that. And so um, I think that really dealing with people's mindsets, and, and I will say this, I think that some of the things, um, historically for many black Americans, the black church mm -hmm. was all of that. You could go there, get your food, you could, uh, pray away this stuff that was going on, cathartic release through dance and song and possession of spirit. But what happens when that's not enough? And then particularly um, from an LGBTQ standpoint, being outcasted because of how you were born or who you are. Right. And so oftentimes we've used the club as that, right? And so one of the things that I'm looking at is where do we meet the people where they are? Um, in my religious paradigm, Jesus didn't have no church. He went to where the people are. So how do we take these services to people? And also, too, is finding therapists or mental health professionals who understand who you are. At Black Transmen Inc. in the Maryland, D.C. area, we don't send our guys to everybody. And we do screen mental health professionals. Like there's a, a big institution in, in Baltimore that shall remain nameless. And we were told in terms of some of the things that were going on um, in terms of uh, transgender health care, just to hold off a little bit of sending guys there. And so we did. Okay. Um, I think it's very important also too that we share uh, inf health care information with each other, right? And I think that it's also important that we understand that we may have to take someone to go take a buddy to the therapist or to the healthcare. Like, that's important too. And I think that it's important that we realize where our people are. And then the overall thing too, in terms of social media, um, learning the role that that plays mm -hmm. in mental health. I know that, I don't know about anybody here, but the, st the, the porn of black death on social media can really wear down your mind. And so creating healthy habits and encouraging others and sharing, lovingly sharing those healthy habits with others, which may mean like going back to the old fashioned way, sitting down and talking to people. Mm -hmm. You know, those things that kind of kept us afloat, plus new advances in mental health care, I think are very important, but understanding where people are is critically important to getting people the help that they need. Yes, go ahead. I just want to add one thing that I took upon myself to, to stop the, 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 the cycle of, of, of trying to keep everything in-house is I talk to my, my children and there's situations they know that I'm in therapy and when they I have even advised them and they have also gone to therapy because I let them know you need to always have somebody you can talk to unconditionally that does not have to be me your father or your mother so those things that I have learned now I'm teaching it to the next generation which is my children and also to teach the children whom I teach 
Yes. And I think one thing that we have to observe also that's happening is the legalization of of discrimination when it mm -hmm. comes to these religious freedom laws that are being passed across the country. Um, and that affects access to care because those laws empower practitioners to say, I'm not going to see you simply because of how you, you identify. Right. Um, I am from the state of Mississippi and Mississippi passed House Bill 1523. And House Bill 1523 means that I can go to Mississippi and maybe I'm with my partner and I need couples counseling, but they can deny me services. And so when you're thinking, okay, I need to reach out, I need to reach out, but there's also that anxiety, will I be rejected by this person before I can even get to the door to be treated? And if we don't recognize that those things are impacting, you know, our ability to receive the services that we need, we're fooling ourselves. You know, I think that's one of the very important things in terms of getting involved, particularly, uh, I know some of my reasons for getting involved with this particular organization is because it, it helps to affect change in all these different ways, especially when you see a, a lot of our southern states with our Project One America and some of the initiatives there. And being actively engaged with some of that uh, definitely helps to know that you are doing at least something um, to further the cause, to make sure that access to care and everything is, is, is really here for everybody. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to really ask the panel is if you can talk about one specific disparity, and each one could take one or maybe add on to others, um, but one specific disparity in minority mental health outcomes or care that you hope to see changed. Um, one for me would be that minorities tend to wait till they're at a point of crisis before they're introduced into the um, mental health um, space. Um, it, we, um, at Mental Health America, and I know America touched on it, that um, we believe in a philosophy we call bef before stage four, and it means we want people to see mental health as any other conditions. You don't wait to that moment of crisis before right. you get them the help that they need. Right. And so that is one thing I would love to see change as we move through and we have these conversations that we're doing things for prevention, we're doing things towards early intervention, not always waiting until we need psychiatric um, hospitalization to get treatment. Right. Anyone else? Um, I think when I um, reflect on disparities um, in communities of color, um, I think about the unspoken disparity related to suicide, mm -hmm. um, specifically um, the fact that when we talk about transgender communities, 49% um, of black trans people have attempted suicide. Wow. Um, and that's just, I mean, it, it, it baffles me. Um, I, I think oftentimes when we have that discussion again, if we look at this through a, a lens of race and racial identity, we don't close our eyes and think about black people. Right. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not existing. It doesn't mean that this isn't an issue. Um, and I, I very much want to see that number change. Um, I very much want to see more conversations and more suggestions of how we can change this number mm -hmm. um, because that, that's absolutely unacceptable. Um, and there are so many contributing factors that are creating that number right. um, and so many factors that continue to happen in silence. Yeah. I would, I would say um, as, an, as an educator of elementary as well as high that it's important that if we bring these tools within the school system um, and not just necessarily teach academics, but teach the importance of mental health and what does mental health, what does it look like? And of definitely with people of color. And if we, if we start to bring it at, at a very um, basic level, um, elementary level, and then hopefully they will continue to see that as, as, as they share more of themselves with people whom they trust, that they begin to see that it makes a difference, that they have more, people will encourage them as opposed to using other dynamics, uh, game related activities or things such as that, um, that they can have more of a positive tool mm -hmm. to use. I'd like to lift up the financial barriers that many of us face, uh, particularly around insurance and navigating that nightmare world of insurance, particularly for trans folks who have to go through enormous hurdles to like just get name changes and then you have to change that across the board. Is the insurance matching your gender market? Does that mean that you can get your hormones? And I think that single payer would do really well to help people access the care that they need. People should not be dying 
are falling into stage four mental health um, issues because they don't have the money to go see a therapist or to go see a professional. P particularly where I live in Baltimore, a lot of um, the cross-section, we talked about intersectionality, you do have um, particularly trans community incredibly wounded by violence. And a lot of that looks like um, hate crimes that go unreported that are told anecdotally on top of housing insecurity, on top of survival sex work that many um, of our kin are going through. And so a lot of that does have to do with finances. And I think that we really need to start um, looking at what's going on down the street on Capitol Hill and figuring out ways that we can increase access to care regardless of finances. That's still a big problem for people over top of the grief that people feel because they've lost. Mm -hmm. Like how, how are we dealing with the death and how, how does that play into already the, the mental health challenges that we do have? Right. I, there are over 200 murders in Baltimore. And I know that currently um, I'm working with other activists to try to set up a, a dedicated grief support group for LGBTQ people because the support groups that we may or may not have in Baltimore, word on the street is they, not, they might not be too friendly to LGBTQ people. So, so even structures that do exist to help low-income people may not be always friendly to our needs and concerns. Okay. And so I think it, 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 it behooves us to really look at these structures and make them accessible to everyone. You know, and with that, if you can hold on to the mic, Reverend Moses. Um, you know, as we're sort of wrapping up this first panel, I wanted to see if everyone can sort of give a little bit, as we do have in-house resources, there's uh, vendors that are set up to kind of give folks a little bit of exposure to what are the, the opportunities for self-care out there. Um, if you can, based on your sort of circle and sphere of influence, um, provide how can people of color who belong to the LGBTQ community find access to competent care based on your own sort of sphere of influence? Well, I, I mean, I think that um, I would be remiss um, if I didn't mention just as a, as a priest and as a person who practiced multiple, a multiplicity of spirituality, I think that one of the things that contributes to um, um, mental health challenges for us is a lack of community in terms of spiritual wellness, um, going to communities that we've gone to because our families are in the church and these, these churches can be very hateful. And so one of the, the suggestions that I, I make to people, particularly young people who are suffering in that way, uh, if they don't want to seek therapy, at least find a spirituality or modality that allows you to go into the core of yourself. If that means meditation, if that means yoga, if that means running around Lake Montebello in Baltimore, please do it. I think that a lot of times we are looking to structures. It's kind of like that gym outfit that you wore in high school. I'm 43 now. I can't fit that outfit. So why would I fit into a space that I, as a child fed me, but I have outgrown it. So I do advise people in terms of spirituality, look at the panoplies of spirituality that resonate with your, your spirit and go forward in that. And that can do a long way to opening up a, a, a world to you that now you have created spaces where you can meet those mental health challenges. Thank you. I would say one thing that's very basic is um, to thyself be true. And, and, and with, with, with that, I would tell people to journal. Uh, even if you may not have access, I mean, a very basic, even with young, young children, begin to journal what you feel, what you're thinking, just to, so you get those feelings and those emotions out. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's the beginning of self-care. And you're actually able to look at it maybe a week or so later and see what you have gone through and how you got through it. So if, if you have a, a record of the things you have gone through and see that, yes, yet though I thought I was going, I was going to make it, or I was going to kill myself, or, or people would throw me, turn me totally away, I'm still here. And you have that documentation. And so something very basic is journaling. Uh, I, I tell a lot of my younger people to, to do that. And I think for myself, um, it's really about reaching a starting point where I give myself permission to participate with my own self-care. Mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes, I don't carve that space out for myself. Um, work is real, finances is real, gotta have food in my refrigerator, rent is always due on the first, whether I have the money or not. Um, and so it's easy to say, I don't have time for that, or 
oftentimes being in a, in a caretaker role, I've got to make sure that everyone else is good um, and neglect my own form of self-care. Um, and so I think part of that is just giving myself permission to say, you know what, like I'm going to take care of myself. Um, and oftentimes having that conversation also about what self-care is and what that looks like for you. Um, that it doesn't always have to be like a mani-pedi or something like that, but it can be just connecting with your own sense of spirituality or nature or whatever you need to locate your joy space. Um, but just give yourself permission to, to experience that. Awesome. I think, um Probably one of the most important things that I've ever done for myself um, since I have a, I'm living with this ongoing condition is feeling very, very comfortable in saying no to people. Yes, yes, yes. And created that boundary, that protected boundary around yourself that where you say, this is my space. Mm -hmm. And right now, I can't let anyone else in. Mm -hmm. It is 100% OK to say, no, I'm sorry. I cannot take this on right now. I have to make sure that I'm okay first. You know, they always talk about, you know, when a lifeguard is, you know, rescuing someone, that they have to rescue themselves first. Yeah. And you know, when you get on the airline and the mask, they say the mask drop down, put yours on first, yeah, then assist yeah, yeah. the person next to you. A lot of times we let that go and we become exhausted because we're trying to help everyone else and we let ourselves suffer. So my thing is, no, if I cannot do it, I cannot do it, but at the end of the day, I need to be okay. And you need to be okay in telling people, no, not today. And feel totally fine and empowered with it. Whenever I'm okay to help, I, maybe I will. But today, no, it's not happening. Uh, that's very true. I often say to myself, you know, I, I can only give if my cup is full and then it's flowing over, right? I can't give anything if my cup is, is halfway or not full, right? So I, with that, I want to thank all of our first panel. If you can please uh, join me with thanking them. And so right now, while we're transitioning to our second panel, I just want to announce a couple things. Uh, we're having an ongoing contest throughout the afternoon. We just want to give away some door prizes. So I think folks would have been having a raffle tickets. We're not going to announce anything right now. So no need to like go searching for it right now. We'll, we'll come back to that later. I know some of you all already. Um, we're going to come back to that later. But just make sure and keep those handy. And then apart from that, especially for those online, we have a local jeweler here, Balvin Dalston. Um, you can follow him on Instagram at at Balando Designs, which is at B-A-L-A-N-D-O Designs, and he will also be giving away a special prize for folks who follow him as well. Um, and it's really, really, do you want to model a piece uh, of jewelry right now? <laughs> this is JP. JP is my colleague here at, at the Human Rights Campaign who has been very instrumental in putting this afternoon together. Um, yeah, so some really, really nice jewelry pieces. Um, so feel free to do that, and as well, he is also here as well. Um, throughout the evening, there are also more resources off to the sides, so feel free um, to make sure that you uh, take a pass at any of those. And we're gonna jump right in, but first we're gonna have a short um, announcement from Lizbeth Melendez Rivera, uh, a staff member here at HRC, who is also going to be on our second panel. So once you do your um, announcement, then I'll do your bio. You want to come to the mic? As um, just told, I am the director of Latinx and Catholic Initiatives here at HRC. My job is to work at the intersections of faith, sexual orientation, family, reconciliation. Um, and today, I just want to make a brief announcement. We are currently working on a guide called Just As They Are, and it's a guide of the dangers of religious-based of religious -based conversion therapy. And how do we, as mentioned both by Reverend Moises and others, seek sometimes the solace of our faith spaces in order to heal? And how do we discern where to go for a loving, uh, supportive uh, faith experience versus those that are rejectful and send to tend to send messages as um, 
to send us away from faith, from our faith and our God, and how to direct us to others. Just so that you know, this is the cover of our publication. If you're interested in receiving the publication, uh, just as it would be published in the next few weeks, just send us an email at religion at hrc.org. Again, that is religion at hrc.org. And to understand what it is that we're talking about, just know that these are some of the consequences, some of the dangers of religion-based conversion therapy. 8.4 times more likely likely to report having attempted suicide, 5.9 times more likely to report high levels of depression, 3, 4 point times more likely to use illegal drugs, and 3, 4 more times more likely to engage in unsafe sex. This has a lot to do with when we are told that God that we're grown up to believe is a loving one is presented to us as a rejectful one. And it is therefore core to the subject and the themes of this evening. So again, if you're interested in seeing some of the findings, and by the way, these are findings based on collaboration with the Family Acceptance Project, uh, a project of Dr. Kaylin Ryan at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, but the publication obviously will expand more on all of this, and we hope that you're all interested in taking a look at it, as it really takes a look at it from a perspective of people of color to begin with, and the you know, and LGBTQ people as minorities as a whole group. So thank you. Thank you. And so with that, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we will be welcoming our second panel now. And this is our panel um, of advocates and folks who will be speaking from their lived experiences. Um, and so with, without uh, much further delay, I want to welcome first, I feel like I should be playing music now, Racine Pendarvis, <laughs> known as the High Priestess of Love, the Queen of the Shameless Plug, and the Goddess of DC, is an MC, entertainer, social media personality, activist, former advisory neighborhood commissioner of Washington, DC, and lifelong Washingtonian. In addition to being a columnist for Swerve Magazine, Racine is a contributor to the Unleashed Voice and Q Virginia magazines. Racine can be seen regularly right here at the Human Rights Campaign headquarters as the host of the Ask Racine Show, a free monthly live event in Washington, DC. We now have Dior Vargas. Dior is a Latina feminist mental health activist and the creator of the People of Color and Mental Illness Photo Project, a response to the invisibility of people of color in the media representation of mental illness. She travels around the country giving keynotes, hosting workshops, and speaking on panels. Dior is the recipient of numerous awards, including the White House Champion of Change for Disability Advocacy Across Generations, a Voices of the Year honoree at hashtag blogher15 experts among us conference and 2015 alternatives experts I'm sorry and 2015 alternatives conference cookie gant and bill compton lgbtqi leadership award thank you for joining us <laughs> alexander hardy is a writer educator lupus survivor mental health advocate and co-host of the Extraordinary Negroes podcast. Check it out. Now, a mental health first aid trainer, he is currently preparing to launch a year-long multimedia mental health campaign to address mental and emotional wellness in black and brown communities. Alex does not believe in snow or Delaware. <laughs> and finally, we have Imadi Nabukun. A writer and journalist living in the D.C. area, Imadi originally wrote Depressed While Black for her 2015 Columbia University's Masters of Fine Arts thesis. Imadi later expanded Depressed While Black into an online community and an in-progress book that explores race, religion, and romance, all while popping Prozac and navigating therapy. Please welcome all of our panelists. <laughs> So before we jump into the actual questions, if you would mind, again, just going, um, either, whoever wants to go first, um, but just say something about yourself and, and the importance of this conversation this afternoon. Uh, so my name is Dior Vargas, and I'm honored to be here. And uh, 
For me, this conversation is crucial and extremely important because it's not a topic that is discussed normally when it comes to the broader mental health conversation. Uh, the fact that we have to have our own month is, is clear, the fact that we really need to focus on these issues more. And I think that it needs to be more of, our prior, more of a priority in so many spaces. And so I'm really happy to be having this conversation at the intersection between race, ethnicity, mental illness, and uh, LGBTQ uh, plus identity. So I think this is a really, really important conversation. Thank you. Who's next? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Imade. Um, I was first uh, first realized that um, I dealt with depression when I was a grad student in LA, and uh, I just took on way too much. I took on um, a documentary, a short documentary, all by myself, and it wasn't until I was pretty much speeding on a Los Angeles highway, wanting to die, that I realized that depression is definitely not a white person disease; that anyone can get it. And um, I was diagnosed with clinical depression in December 2012. And it took me about four months, four or five months, of me just pretty much agonizing over if I should get on medicine. I was raised in a very strict uh, Pentecostal background. And I was told pretty much that if you take antidepressants, that your faith as a Christian or just as a spiritual person is less than someone who doesn't take antidepressants. And um, I just, I got into the mental health advocacy work because I don't want people to struggle alone uh, due to stigma uh, for so long when they could be getting the love and the support and the mental health treatment that they need. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alex Hardy again. Thanks for having me here. Um, this, important, this conversation is important because um, I've seen and witnessed both hand, um, but firsthand the importance of um, how devastating it can be to be suffering with any type of mental illness without either without resources or without knowing that resources do even exist. So um, for me, I just try to you know keep my mental health advocacy as part of my regular day and talk about it just as well, just as often as I talk about anything else that's bothering me. Um, and I try to encourage other people to do the same. Um, and yeah, pretty much like my, my mission with all of this stuff is to make sure that like, um, that another person doesn't have to experience that fear and desperation that kind of comes with struggling um, alone, struggling in silence and struggling and maybe feeling that no one will understand you, people won't accept you, things like that. So I'm just kind of here to make it a, a regular everyday conversation just like everything else that we deal with. Awesome. Thank you. First of all, I'm very grateful and honored to be here. Um, you know that sometimes that when we get in spaces like this, it gets very heavy when we talk about issues like this, I think about so many people that did not make it over. And I think about the importance of mental health to talk about is, uh, issues surrounding mental health because it is a gateway to everything. Sexism, alcoholism, racism. You know, it is the gateway to so many things that affect us that we walk around and it's that old saying, hurt people, hurt people. And many of us are walking in our brokenness. And as we walk in our brokenness, we continue to do it over and over again. And we take it to our homes, we take it to our children, and it becomes a generation of generation upon generation of brokenness. And we don't do the issue, we don't deal with the issues to begin to talk about healing as a people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and um, can I, um, Reclaim my time. <laughs> I like to reclaim my time. So let me just say this. I've been dying to use that. I've been dying to use that. But let me just say that in this space, I even felt a little, a little heavy for a second. And I want everybody to stand up for a minute. Address the folks at home, too. So And everybody at home and watching us Facebook Live, I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I want you to breathe in. And then I want you to let go and exhale. And let go of all the negative energy that you came in here with today. Just let it go for a minute. The stuff that you've gone through, the things that you've heard, the trials and the tribulations of your life, just let it go for a minute. And we have to take those moments to do the healing, to do the work, 
and begin the dialogue. Now hug yourself and tell yourself I love me, that I'm beautiful, that I'm worthy, that I am loving, that I am enough. And I'm worthy at a place at the table. Now sit on down and let's have a place at the table. So Racine, let's, let's start with you. Um, I wanna find out what are two most important lessons that you've learned through your advocacy or lived experience about LGBTQ, people of color, and their mental health? That too many times people are dying and walking around like the walking dead. And when they're walking around like the walking dead, it is, it's, it's the simple things that how we live and how we acknowledge one another. And the simple ways that we greet each other and smiles that we greet each other, how that makes the difference and acknowledging one another in that space that we greet each other, that I see you, that I see that you're beautiful, that you have value, that you, that you have a presence in this world. Because so many of us are walking around and we have not been told that we were enough, that we were beautiful, that we were special, and God made us this way. And so many of us heard and have been we have been cast aside, and we have been the throwaways, and we have, been, we have been beat down, and then we turn around and do it to one another. And when we begin to do that, it becomes a cycle over and over again. So it is important that we, we begin to talk about mental health, because what I see, especially now, in the age of this wonderful social media explosion, the harm that it can do when people tweet out vicious things, when people send out different things, and how that affects people. Cyberbullying mm -hmm. is very vicious because people do it and you don't know who they are. And they could be sitting right next to you on your job, in your home, and in your church. And because they know who you are, they attack you as they wear masks. Mm -hmm. So we're walking around and we're not talking about those issues that are affecting us. Dior, can you talk about what you've experienced with regards to the specific lessons that you've learned through your advocacy? Uh, I've had the privilege of speaking to a lot of people about their experiences and constantly hearing how people aren't seen, they're not heard, they're not acknowledged, and they're constantly being made to feel that they don't matter and that their lives aren't worthy. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, heartbreaking to see so many people ending their lives because of the consistency in, in seeing lives being ended uh, senselessly. And I think that we need to uplift one another mm -hmm. within the community. Um, I, at some point in the conversation, and I, and I guess I'll do it right now, I think it's important that we support one another, that I think in the Latinx community, we acknowledge the anti-blackness and that we acknowledge our proximity to white supremacy and how we really need to support one another. And I think that that's something that we really need to confront. I think that that is something that really prevents us from working together and we need to respect one another. And so um, I think that's something that we really need to call out mm -hmm. in one another. And um, I think that could also contribute to people feeling worthy and feeling like they're part, they're part of the community. Thank you. Imari, I have a question for you. Um, since you spend a lot of time talking and writing about Depressed White Black, um, what can people not currently struggling with mental health challenges do to improve the workplace for colleagues, a space for friends, families? Uh, what, 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 have, what kind of what kind of advice can you give there? Um, I would just say to just go deeper. I think that in a lot of conversations, it's very easy to get out of them and not, not have someone ask more questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I say I had a bad weekend, someone can say, oh, well, hope you do better, and then they'll just leave. And that could have been an opportunity to dive deeper in the conversation and really, like, have 
a, a conversation about what's going on and the, the issues that I feel like there's a legacy of slavery in the sense of a lot of times when it comes to black and brown lives, our worth is tied to our physical labor. Mm. And so what happens is that as long as we're producing, as long as we are hitting the deadlines, as long as we're coming to class, it feels like no one is talking to us. And just when we don't produce, that's when, oh, are you okay? But I feel like we need to be more proactive in having conversations, like we were talking about before, before stage four, before the person is unable to take a shower, right. before the person is unable to show up to work. And I think that if we can start having conversations on a preventative level, on a, on a, on a maintenance, a mental health maintenance level, I think that will help a lot. Thank you. And um, Alex, you know, um, we're seeing a sort of a trend of, of talking about pan-Africanism. You know, uh, as you belong to the, the Afro-Latino Latino, uh, community yourself, um, where have you seen that? Where has that intersection come into your work, um, even in your podcast or in some of, some of your writing on thecoloredboy.com? Can you talk about a little bit about that? About the intersection of? of being black and where it fits in and, and, and that sort of, and coping with that and then being also a member of the LGBTQ community. <clears throat> well, yes, being black is, 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 being black ain't no crystal stare, I'll say. Um, yeah, it's just, just going through the world and just being yourself, loving yourself, accepting your blackness, accepting the, all of that comes with us. I mean, it's not always easy to do. So I just think that um, we as black folks have to give ourselves permission to just be whole vulnerable people and like shed that strong black man, strong black woman crap because like that will kill you. Um, and just know that it's okay to experience the full range of emotions. Um, I definitely see in Latino communities, my family is Panamanian on one side. Um, we definitely, it's the same kind of uh, hesitance to discuss these things openly. Um, so, I mean, for me, it's just a matter of just showing up in the world the way I am, um, you know, being open about the things that I'm experiencing mentally and emotionally, um, and hoping that others in that, you know, the Panaman community, the LGBT community, black community, um, also see that um, me writing about it or talking about it or doing panels about mental health, like it doesn't make me a weaker person, just like being um, in, the middle, in the midst of something or struggling in some way, it doesn't make you a weak person or a lesser person or anything like that. So it's really just showing up, you know, who I am, how I am, and encouraging other people to do the same. And um, know that, you know, acknowledging those like weaker moments or those, those, those moments of vulnerability like does not make us any less of a person or any greater human being or like any worthy of a lover or a friend or anything like that. Uh, thank you for that. You know, um, specifically, you know, within my own family, we were just hit with a, a very significant life event. Um, you know, the passing of a very dear loved one. And uh, as it speaks to families, I want to really hone in on that conversation a little bit. Uh, how can people take care of their family and friends they suspect or know are struggling with mental health challenges? And please, anyone jump in. I'll just say um, one thing that uh, anyone can do uh, to help someone, um, everyone's mental health situation looks different. Depression looks different on everyone. Anxiety is different for everyone. Everyone's suicidal ideations are differently, um, uh, manifest differently. So what I will say is that even if you have a coworker, a friend, neighbor, boyfriend, girlfriend, anyone that you encounter on your daily basis, you can't know because often even the person who's struggling doesn't know all of what they're going through. So what you can do is ask them or find out how they want to be supported. So you may not know, you know what caused their depression or what caused their anxiety or what the root is or what causes them to cry at night. But you know, um, it can be something as simple as checking up on them. I have people text me to remind me to eat because I forget sometimes. Um, did you eat today? Did you take a shower today? Have you been out the house today? Um, what do you need? Do you need me to help you do X, Y, Z? You can help someone make an appointment, you know, to go see a therapist or to, you know, find a mental health professional, because that's often that can be really daunting. You know, the fact the um, having to go through a list of professionals and find someone that works for you. So just anything that you can do to make life easier for that next person is helpful. So like I said, you may not know the diagnosis, but any little thing you can do is helpful. Dior and then Racine. I think it's important to create a space and an environment where talking about your feelings and talking about your mental health is okay and something that you can do comfortably. I also think that it's important to empower the individual and let them know that they have agency and so give them the space to express what they're feeling and also let them have that space to say how can I help myself, how can 
if, if uh, I am in a situation where I see someone in pain, how can I best support you? What do you need from me? How can I help you in the way that fits what you need? And so mm -hmm. let them feel empowered to help themselves and help other people help them. Racine? It's so important that we, we talk about the issues openly yes. and have those open tape, open dialogues and we discuss it. You know, I'm from a generation of, um, I've been here a long time. Um, I am definitely an AARP member. And um, I come from a generation where folks who had mental health, we always had them around. They were always there and we talked about them. You know, everybody had the crazy Mary, your cousin Mary who was a little off or your aunt or your uncle who was a little off, and they were always there. And we loved them, we talked about them, they were at the table with us. We, they weren't the secret. They weren't someone we put away or we locked away or we told everybody, oh, she's on Prozac, she has problems. We talked about it and we welcomed them to the table and we made them feel comfortable in a space where they would talk about the issues that they were dealing with and we made it a safe haven, always. And it's so important that we do that. And let me say, on the flip side, as someone who has taken care of my mother, who just turned 90 this year, who is the light of my life, and, and she is the, the, the oldest living member in the family now, and she is, she's been my ally, she's been my champion, she has allowed me to shine and be the queen that you see before you today. That, and I'm so grateful I had a mother who was like that, and I'm now one of her caretakers. And she has dementia. And as a caretaker, it is, it, it is very taxing and it's very, very, it, at some days, it, it, it drains everything out of me. But then I, I find ways to find the humor and laugh. The other day I was talking with her and I had my hair all out and it was all over and I was looking like a wild woman. And she said to me, well, who was that lady that was in here with all the gray hair that looked like me? I said, mom, that was me. And she pulled back and she looked and she said, it sure was. <laughs> and so you have to laugh at those moments and find the humor and find the laughter because in their moments of where they're going through dementia and Alzheimer's or any kind of illness, they're still present. And they have moments when they show up at the table and they're very present. And you have to allow them to have those moments. And as a caretaker, you have to laugh. Treat yourself to a pedicure. Go out, take care of yourself, get a haircut, a, a, a massage, talk to somebody, get you a few golden girls, get you Blanche, Rose, Sophia, get you some people, get you a neighbor that you could talk to just sitting on a porch or a dog that you can play with or a cat that will pet you and give you unconditional love, but find those moments for yourself and it's okay to be a little selfish and sometimes no is a wonderful word because it helps you heal. Sometimes you can say, no, I can't do that today because I need to take care of me and it's important. Mm -hmm. Imadi, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, just to kind of piggyback what everybody's saying, which is amazing. Um, I just wanted to touch on the fact that uh, about two years ago, um, I had a suicide attempt and I, what, the, first, the first phone call out of uh, a mental hospital is usually like can be very memorable because you're calling to drop really bad news and you're hoping that they are not gonna like just freak out. And so I remember uh, that first phone call to my mom and she is a hardcore uh, Christian from Church of God in Christ, speaking in tongues, all that. And you know, I told her what happened and she was just like, oh no, like, but I took you to Disney World <laughs> and, you know, oh no, oh no, and all this stuff. And I just wanted to really reiterate what Dior was saying, was, which is that you, it's important to ask what your loved one needs because what you think they need may not be what they actually need. And in response to my mom, you know, telling me, you know, you had a, you had a good childhood, you went to Disney World, all this stuff. I was like, mom, like, I can't remember the last time you told me you love me. Like, I literally, from the time that I'm like 28 to a child, like in between that time, I cannot remember my mom telling me she loves me. 
And I just want to like strongly encourage that like the little things, the little things that you do for that loved one that's dealing with depression, like it means so much more than like some expensive trip somewhere. Sometimes the little things of like, girl, you've been in the house for three days. Let's get out. Let's go to Starbucks. Let's go and, you know, get go to a park. Like those tiny little things like mean so much. And I do want to encourage all of you that, you know, your voice matters and what you're doing to talk to your friends, to encourage your friends to get mental health, it matters and you're not wasting your time. We remember everything. And it's in those moments at our lowest moments that we remember the tiny things of kindness that you guys offered. So thank you and keep doing what you're doing. And Amada, don't give away the mic. Um, with our last round of conversation, question here, um, personally, um, I know we were sort of mentioning a few things that we can do, but I want to just speak specifically from all of your work, from all of your experience, um, name two things that LGBTQ people of color can do today to improve their mental health. For me, so as we're doing that, like for me, I know I'm from the Caribbean, I need sun. Earlier today, I went and laid out by the pool because I just knew that that's what I needed to get my spirit up, right? There are little things that we can each do um, for your own mental health. Um, so whatever you, whatever you can speak to right now that you can leave us with and also uh, feel free to kind of uh, give a little bit of synopsis about what are some of your work and stuff like that and where folks can find you. So I think it's important that we promote self-advocacy mm -hmm. amongst our community and it's important to mm -hmm. think about before we're in crisis, what do we need? Uh, there's a program called uh, RAP, which is Re Wellness Recovery Action Plan, and it's something that people can do before they're in crisis. Mm -hmm. So it could be a list of mental health professionals you're, you're okay seeing, uh, maybe a psychiatric ward you've been to that you didn't like and you don't want to be put back there. Um, Self-care tips, uh, things that people can do to help you. I think that it's important to be able to advocate for yourself before and during and after mm -hmm. going through a mental health crisis. Um, and uh, I guess uh, in terms of like my personal work, uh, I guess if you just Google Dior Vargas, you'll find everything there. Um, and in terms of just sharing just a little bit of my personal story, because I, I, I haven't mentioned it, um, I live with depression and anxiety. I'm a suicide attempt survivor. And um, uh, last year was made it 10 years since my last suicide attempt. And so I think that it's important to really think about one's quality of life. Mm -hmm. I think that um, a lot of us in our community, we're always thinking about who comes after us, making sure that they have a better life than we did. And I think that mental health is the, a huge part of it. Mm. You can't have good relationships. You can't hold a job, you really can't do anything without good mental health and so we need to prioritize it and thinking about it in terms of wellness and taking care of ourselves and taking care of our community. Mental health is a community issue and we need to be there for one another. Thank you. Um, two things. One, I want you to affirm yourself every day. I want you to get up in the morning and I want you to look at yourself in the mirror and I want you to use whatever you need to get there. In the immortal words of the help, you are kind, you are smart, you is important. <laughs> and find phrases that make you feel good. Tell yourself every morning that you are beautiful. Love yourself. If you're 25 pounds overweight, rub that belly even harder. And embrace your beautiful self and love you in that process of just being in the moment of affirming who you are. And then I want you to also listen to some good music. Music just makes you feel good. Get you a theme song and play it in your head when you walk down the street every day. <laughs> you know, just play it. If you want to feel like Beyonce, then be that Beyonce. You want to feel like Rihanna, then be Rihanna. But get you a theme song, because sometimes I play it in the morning and play it in my head, and I just, because you don't know what you're going to deal with. What you're going to deal with when you go out that door. But if you're feeling good, can't nobody steal your joy. If you're feeling good, and you've already put your Diana Ross on, and you're feeling it, then feel it. 
You know, because trust me, the world will hit you as soon as you get out that door. And if you don't affirm yourself or put your armor on or do what you need to do or get into that space, and when you get on the bus or get behind that wheel of the car or you sitting on somebody next to them to just giving off some energy that ain't right, you'll be like, I think you need a hug today. And you can turn to that person and give them some love because you already loved up. And if you want to follow me, that's Racine on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. R-A-Y-C-E-E-E-N. <laughs> the Ask Racine Show here. First Wednesdays of every month, HRC, it's an LGBT affirming space, a live talk show for us and about us. First Wednesdays, HRC, get you some. <laughs> <laughs> um, two things that we can do. One is just allow yourself to just be a, a whole ass regular person. Like you're not gonna walk outside and look and feel like a superhero every day. Some days you're gonna feel like a shitty mess. Some days, you know, your hair just won't come together. Some days your skin will be crappy. Some days, you know, your anxiety is through the roof. Some, just whatever it is, just accept that you're not going to be Beyonce every day. Um, you know, you're not, some days you gotta be Michelle. You know, it's okay. <laughs> um, and it's fine. It happens. That's, that's just that's just a circle of life. You can't. It just won't be a, a, a ten out of ten day all the time, um, and that's for me personally because I know I am a person who um, strives for perfection and have really high standards for myself. And as far as like the work that I'm doing or with writing in particular, um, you know, you you have all these. You want to be everything to everyone, and you want to make everyone happy. And you want to make your grandparents proud, and you want to have, you know, your parents talk about you kindly and say good things about you to their friends and all that kind of stuff. But like. Yeah, at the end of the day, I just had to realize it's my life. You can't win and you can't um, please everyone all the time, and that's, and that's okay. Like, if someone, best friend, mother, boyfriend, boss is disappointed, they'll ultimately have to deal. So I just, for, for me, it's about, and I'm, this is the process, just giving myself permission to be just a whole person and not just thinking about or focusing on the good and the positive and the beautiful and the pretty and the things that look good for social media. Um, on a personal note for my self-care, I eat. Um, Eating is like the best thing since I don't even know, but that's just that's what brings me the most joy. Um, yeah, I don't have my eater shot on today, but yeah, rice, oxtail, chicken, anything with gravy, just like all these things. These are this is a part of my self care situation. I don't count calories. I don't believe in it. Um, aside from that, I can be found at um, thecoloredboy.com is where I do most of my writing, and also host a podcast called The Extraordinary Negroes with Jay Connor. And we just put out a recent episode this past week. Um, I also write for VerySmartBrothers.com, where I'm a senior writer there. And also Ebony and CNN and local Alex Hardy, Alexander Hardy. There are a couple ones. There are a couple white Alex Hardys out there, but that's not me. So. <laughs> yeah, I would say for myself, I just try to live a stigma-free life. Uh, just right, right where I am. So if that stigma-free life only includes me, then that's cool. I try to live in a, in a stigma-free life by being open, by being honest about uh, my struggles with mental health. And what I find is that other people have connected with my stories and then we form a community and then before you know it you know five six seven eight people are living the stigma free life so i would just say just start where you are in chipping away at the mental health stigma and i will also say for me i have to divorce myself from productivity i continue to struggle with placing my identity and how much I produce, whether it's writing, whether it's talking to a number of people, you know, a lot of people are networking. So I would just say that make sure that your worth is totally um, self-contained and self-sufficient and not in only what you produce. So. Awesome. Well, thank you all. So now we're going to have the remainder of our, all of our panelists kind of come back to the stage, and we're going to do a, a short Q&A uh, section here. Um, but while we wait on that, I just want to take a moment to thank once again all of our, our sponsors and par partners and collaborators who uh, helped to make this afternoon possible. Um, we are talking about uh, Whitman Walker, uh, Mental Health America, Impulse Group DC, 
Um, and then also all of the individual contributors who were here today, please, if you have any time after the event, uh, make sure to go up to them, talk, talk with them, find out how you can follow them, how you can um, be a part of their audiences. Again, we have more resources at the sides for after. And we're, we're good. All right. So we're going to be 